I'm Ryan, this is 52 SE Friday Week 9. What is the magnificent sea and enemy take and clown harem? Sometimes less is more, and doing one single thing to the best of your ability produces a rare type of elegance that's seen nowhere else. I'm talking about tanks that hard commit to a focus on a single animal, or a relationship between animals that draws the eye, intrigues the mind, and produces some of the most stunning displays out there. The magnificent harem is one of them. What are the challenges, and how do we intend to solve them? All that is coming up. Anyone who's seen a clown nestled into its anemone already knows part of what we're after here. There's a rhythmic dance between these two animals. However, equally as impressive is how a group of clownfish that bring life and vibrance to a display. In fact, many of these fish will live harmoniously together in the same anemone host, often referred to as a clown harem. However, all the clowns are not equal. There's a boss in the tank, and it's the single female. She will continually keep the rest of the harem in check, as well as keeping everyone safe and protecting their host. Even in the marine tank, very commonly laying and hatching eggs, a dance of gas exchange, keeping them covered in oxygen-rich water. You also see them nipping at the eggs, keeping them clean of algae. These tiny eggs containing the next generation of clowns that can absolutely be raised in home aquaria, and often used to create new clown harems like this one. We've done a BRS TV clown harem before. Many said it couldn't be done, but we grew them from babies, cared for them successfully for half a decade, even raised their babies. So what's different this time? The answer is we're attempting the next step to replace the easy to care for but unnatural host of the rose bubble tip anemones with a natural host, the Magnifica anemone. The Magnifica anemone, another challenge that many say is very difficult, but just like the clown harem, I don't believe that will turn out to be true. It's just that the hobby as a whole doesn't understand the animal's biology well enough to support it. We're going to change that. The Magnifica is just an entirely different animal than a bubble tip. It can get much bigger, much more fleshy, but still naturally split when necessary. They can do well in natural currents found somewhat deeper, but can also tolerate turbulent water found in shallower reefs. It's not uncommon to find both the clown harem and the Magnificas in lagoons just below the surface of the water or even fully exposed during low tide. Our mission with today's episode, help anyone inspired by this type of species specific marine tank build their own and make yet another tank type that was once considered hard or expert only easy. This episode is going to be different than the others because we are attempting something very specific with a very specific set of tools. This is what most would refer to as an expert only tank, but the experts would refer to it as easy because it's just a list of tools and methods that you need to be successful. There are two parts to this tank, the clowns and the anemone, starting with the clowns. If you want to do this, there are eight things that matter. What you're raising here is a community of fish that will thrive together as long as you consider what it takes to serve a community and help avoid all the reasons that they would normally bicker and fight. What I'm about to share here is my way that worked for me. I suggest doing all eight things. Only seven may not work. This isn't a choose your own adventure buffet. It's a recipe for success that worked for me previously, and there's no reason for me to deviate from that this time. First, I use Ocellaris clowns the first time and will again this time because they're amongst the most docile. There are tons of variants of Ocellaris clowns to choose from, and most are captive bred. People ask if you can do this with other types of clowns, and the answer is, if you can find someone who's done it successfully with the species that you're considering for more than a few years, it can be done, but it may be harder. If you can't, then probably not. It's mostly an aggression thing. Second, I didn't mix types of Ocellaris clowns with others last time, and I won't this time. The reason is the fish communities don't seem to like differences, particularly easy to spot differences. Last time, one of the black clown's faces stayed orange and he was attacked relentlessly. We took him out, let his face change in another tank, and added him back after it turned black without issue. It's hard to say if they didn't like the difference or if he was just easy to spot and target, but having them all look similar as possible makes it a lot easier. Third is safety in numbers and dispersion of aggression. In that 120 gallon tank, we had 30 clowns. There's always a small squabble between fish. It happens in the ocean, and it'll happen to take two. But when you have 30 plus fish, the aggression gets equally dispersed and results in a pretty calm community of fish. Fourth, get them small, and I mean like pinky nail small, preferably from the same clutch if possible. Small fish are just not aggressive, and they figure out who is the boss as part of the natural progression of a community growing up together, which is totally different than throwing a bunch of adults or juveniles in the tank together. Last time we got the harem from Sustainable Aquatics, and we'll do the same this time. You can probably reach out to Sustainable for an LFS they serve, or your local fish store to reach out to them for you. Most will have a relationship with a the breeder. There should be a significant discount versus buying single adults. 
Fifth, add tons of habitat and homes. In this case, I, I don't mean rock, I mean anemones. I had dozens of RBTAs covering the entire tank. These type of anemones split and grow fast, multiply on their own, and generally very hardy. I do have a couple of tips on these. First, different types of BTAs have a way of killing each other. We tried multiple times to mix rose, green, and other variants, but one dominant type would always be the one left standing. I suggest getting wild ones from the same location or captive ones from the same breeder. There is a good chance that you can get a quantity discount from the right supplier. Another thing we tried is a variety of lights, but there's no question. The RBTA struggled under LEDs and did better under the ATI T5 hybrid. That was 2014, nine years ago, and it's hard to say why that was, but likely because LED reef tech was still in its infancy and we had less experience tuning them. I think part of the key with the success with the Magnifica will be how we tune our LEDs, but more specifically why LEDs might be a better option, something that we'll get to in a moment. Six, maybe the most important, is we feed them normally when they're small, but once they're larger and you start to see aggression, put them on an auto feeder. Hungry animals are aggressive animals, end of story. We have to make food availability a total non-factor. We use the Sustainable Aquatics Clown Foods. I suggest around one pellet per fish every other hour when the lights are on like clockwork. We're going to use the AFS, but any auto feeder will work. Biggest thing is don't let the feeder go empty because no food for even a day or two teaches them that food does have the potential for scarcity and sometimes it can take weeks for them to settle back down. Seventh, up the filtration game and think end game goals. 30 pellets every other hour is a lot more food and pollution input than many of you have probably ever done before. It was for us. Skimmer was not even close to enough and we were doing massive water changes to stop the algae and nutrient buildup. In the end, it was the refugium with a high powered Kessel that did the job. We didn't spend a lot of time worrying about particulate organics or even dissolved organics. We only attempted to remove the resulting nitrate and phosphate as fast as it was produced with the refugium. The high powered fuge was not only the solution to our algae and inorganic nutrient problem, but also the inspiration for a whole series of BRS TV investigates on refugium performance. In the case of our magnificent sea anemone tank, we are largely skipping the skimmer. There is a small Tunes DOC DC skimmer for ozone introduction at 1 to 2 a.m. controlled to be below 450, but not a primary component of filtration, only for water clarity. With this many organics in the water, it can yellow fast. The main filtration, a refugium lit by a Kessel Tuna Sun. More recently, we found that while the purple grow lights performed well in our experiments, the full spectrum lights have more consistent results over the widest range of installs and sources of Cato. We're also attempting a clear roller that fits in the filter sock area. This is one of the best exports of suspended fish weights and foods. Since there's not a wealth of coral polyps in here to eat the organic particulates, let's get them out. This type of roller is new to me. I've never used a sock roller before, but you'll hear our experience with it in the future updates. Eighth, never change anything. I mean anything. Any new fish addition, any changes to lighting, water quality, types of food, anything puts the community on edge and they start to bicker. They're not going to immediately start killing each other, but my goal is a peaceful tank and I'm willing to do my best to serve that need. Again, I think the most important thing here is these eight steps are essentially a recipe for success. Those that follow all eight, not seven, will be successful. Outside of that, you're not trailblazing your own way, which may or may not work specifically in your two or three or after when the clowns are bigger. The most important part of trailblazing is leave markers behind you for the rest of us. Make sure to share what's worked for you and then evolve the conversation. Many people before today have attempted the Magnifica anemone. Some have tried and it died, and some have blazed past for the rest of us showing how it can be done. In 2014, I had never done a clown harem before, but we beat that challenge. Today, I use the same approach to unlocking the Magnifica, researching the forums, YouTube, and asking my peers for not hearsay and secondhand reports, but finding people who have done it successfully. Based on that, these seem to be the keys to success and what we're going to attempt to emulate with this tank. Starting with the best path is a tank like this one, where the Magnifica is the star of the show and the display is designed around its biology. Everything else is secondary to the Magnifica. And rather than trying to throw it into a mixed tank and a collection of corals and then hoping for the best. That's because you can optimize for the flow, lighting, scape for the Magnifica itself, but also because the Magnifica is known for roaming around until it's happy and may sting a lot of corals in its way in a mixed tank. In this case, we use Aquaforest AF Dry Base and Arch Rock to build these ridges. There's a couple of reasons why we decided to use this type of rock. First was the shape lent itself to creating a twin ridge aquascape with a channel down the center, similar to a lot of shallow reefs. 
Our hope is to get the Magnifica to occupy that center space. We also use the AF rock because of its texture. Many of the dry rocks out there are rather sharp, which didn't seem like the best surface for the anemone's foot to attach to or rub up against. AF rock is very smooth. Second, almost every example of success with the Magnifica suggested an established or stable tank. In this case, we're going to use the Dr. Tim's Brightwell's Microbacter 7 and LG Barnes Galaxy Pods for best practice affordable biome for our dry rock. But our real biome donor will be the TBS Tampa Bay Saltwater Sand. This is sand from TBS that, that collects from the ocean, has a natural flake look to it, filled with shells that don't blow around, and the biome of the sea. Before the Magnifica is added, we'll turn on the lights, let the biome cycle and stabilize. Identifying the end of that biome cycle is simple. The tank looks good and isn't overrun with algae or slimes. With the other TBS seeded tanks and 52SC, that biome cycle has been rapid. The number one challenge that reefers seem to have with the Magnifica anemones is they've historically not made that transition from the wild to the marine tank life very well. The primary contributor seems to be transport-based infections. A bath and antibiotic seemingly the solution. There's a lot of DIY approaches out there that you can read about. At this point, I don't have first-hand experience with the DIY baths, and a better approach with this tank is simply get a healthy Magnifica that's already been through that process and healthy prior to coming to our facility. That means a good LFS, buy it from an established tank or an online shop. I've asked marine collectors if they'd be willing to do that for the general public, and they're likely going to do that. We may choose to get one from them, but also we have a couple other lines out there from established tanks for this series as well. That leads us to lighting. Magnificas are fleshy, bulky animals. Unlike the RBTA, which is largely just a balloon of water, the Magnifica has a lot of protein-based tissue to it. To produce that, it is a high-energy organism that requires a lot of light, a lot of carbohydrate and amino production from photosynthesis, and will be using the upper end of the SPS zone of 200 to 350 par. I found nearly a dozen first-hand reports that Magnifica seem to prefer daylight or whiter spectrum, which means an increased use of green, yellow, orange, and red spectrum. The most common reports is the Magnifica will roam around, but if you shine a full spectrum spotlight on it, they'll stop moving, potentially because you gave them what they're like. But why spotlight and not just a fuller spectrum look for the entire tank? That's because most of these were mixed tanks and they want that fluorescent blue pop for everything else in the tank. That's one of the benefits of the animal-focused display. We don't have to be concerned with other animals or corals, and we can make the entire tank whiter. An attempt to keep the Magnifica in our rock channel and off the glass, we'll tune the Kessel 360X in the center to its whitest setting and then use additional green and more red than usual. The overall spectrum blend looking like this, retaining our blue balance of solar blue, but rather than 8 to 10 percent of balanced green, yellow, orange, and red, we increase those. These are the Kessel and AI blade settings, as well as the PAR numbers produced in the tank, mostly in that 200 to 350 range that we talked about. Note that our red spectrum is tuned higher than the others. Our mentality behind that is, unlike most corals that are found in deeper seawater where the red is mostly filtered out and the corals have evolved to that, the Magnifica, more likely than not, has likely evolved to utilize the available energy. We also have a higher ratio of high energy violet light because that's also more available closer to the ocean surface as well. If typical blue reef tank light causes the Magnifica to roam around the tank seeking something, and full spectrum light tends to fulfill or stop that roaming, then I have a working theory that what it's really seeking is that red and maybe violet spectrum. I'm even considering using Kessel's reflectors to focus that fuller spectrum into the center of the tank. Part of designing a tank to feature a specific animal is attempting to get it to stay in that ideal viewing location. For flow, the Magnifica can be found in many different environments, but those that I've talked to that have seen them the most in person on actual reefs tell me that they seem to be close to the surface, bathed in sunlight, in strong flushing currents. When ideal biology is the goal, high light is always dependent on high flow. A definitive term like always used intentionally here. Because of that, we're going to create strong flushing currents with two gyre clouds and strong alternating and intersecting currents. We'll start them positioned high on the sides of the tank as close to the top and as far away from the Magnific as possible to reduce the chances that it roams into them. The goal is flushing currents aimed just over the top of the anemone rather than directly at its base. However, it's very real possibility that we'll need to learn what it likes best and adapt. You'll see that as this series progresses. What about feeding them prey directly? Magnificas can and do feed on organic prey like crustaceans or even small fish. They can and do feed on dissolved organics like amino acids as well. 
Most of the successful approaches to Magnifica seem to involve feeding them a small meal once a week or so. Watch it carefully after. If they spit it out hours later, then use something smaller and easier to digest. We're going to try foods like krill, squid, and jumpomyces, potentially an amino acid supplement like Brightwell's coral amino. But there'll likely be a lot of dissolved organics from a high density of fish, foods, and related waste. Noting that feeding them meaty foods can cause them to grow faster than you might desire, and you can slow them down equally by feeding less. That's the mission with the magnificent sea anemone and clown harem tank, the unique environmental challenges, and how we intend to handle them. Next week, time to meet the nano tank, magnifying what is otherwise lost. Beers TV subscribers get to see it all in the full 52SE playlist right here.